Hello and welcome to the Ostrom Update, COVID-19, a podcast on the COVID-19 pandemic with Dr. Michael Osterholm. Dr. Ostrom is an internationally recognized medical detective and director of the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy, or CIDRAP, at the University of Minnesota. In this podcast, Dr. Ostrom will draw on more than 45 years of experience investigating infectious disease outbreaks to provide straight talk on the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm Chris Dahl, reporter for CIDRAP News, and I'm your host for these conversations. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the Ostrom Update podcast. Last year at this time, the highly transmissible Delta variant became the dominant SARS-CoV-2 variant in the United States, marking the beginning of a surge of new COVID-19 cases and bringing an abrupt end to the country's optimism that the pandemic would soon be over. It would be the beginning of a period culminating in this winter's Omicron wave that may have been the very worst stretch of the pandemic the country has seen. A year and several variants later, We now have a newly dominant variant, BA5, that is the most transmissible version of the virus we've seen. And we could be seeing another surge in cases, but with much of the country having moved on, it's hard to tell at this point. Today, on this July 8th episode of the podcast, we're going to talk about how the BA5 Omicron subvariant may or may not change the trajectory of the pandemic here in the United States and elsewhere. We'll also talk about how reduced testing and the drop-off in official case reporting may affect our insight into what comes next, discuss the FDA's recommendation on updated booster shots, answer a COVID query about the definition of reasonable precautions in this phase of the pandemic, give you the latest on the monkeypox outbreak, and share a beautiful place from one of our listeners. But before we get started, as always, we'll begin with Dr. Ostrom's opening comments and dedication. Thank you, Chris, and welcome back to all of you to another edition of the podcast. Uh, for all of you who are members of the podcast family who have been with us through this uh, long and very challenging time, uh, welcome back. Hopefully today we can, again, share with you useful and helpful information. For those who may be new to the podcast, I will say right up front, if you're looking for absolute answers, uh, you're looking for predictions that are going to come true, uh, this is not the place you want to be. But if you're interested in just trying to get through this, as we all are, uh, we welcome you on board and hope that uh, you find what information you do get to be useful. This has been a very interesting two weeks, and I say interesting in quotes, because if anything, I think the uncertainty of what's happening, why it's happening, what we can do about it, has actually grown, not been reduced by more information. Uh, We'll talk about that today. We'll talk about what are the challenges going forward. What do we know and what don't we know? What do we hope we knew, but we didn't? And uh, I think that this will at least give you a sense of perspective of where we're going. Also, in this podcast, I'm going to stretch it a bit. This is a a very uncomfortable place. Uh, I feel like I'm on a high wire about uh, one mile above the earth with no net below. But I'm going to share with you what I'm doing right now, personally to protect myself from the virus. Uh, And the reasons why I wanna protect myself is not just do I get COVID or not, but the issue of long COVID. Uh, And share with you how I'm trying to live my life. Uh, You know, like all of you want to move on from this virus. And unfortunately, many, many people have moved on from the virus, although the virus hasn't moved on from them. So today I will share with you just in fact, what I've been doing this past week uh, in terms of uh, trying to engage life my friends, family, and colleagues, and at the same time, protect myself as well as protecting my family, friends, and colleagues. So so thank you very, very much for joining us today. Let me just briefly hit on uh, what I think is a very important dedication today, and I hope that the fruits of the labors that I'm going to talk about will bear uh, fruit soon, and you'll understand why that is so important. Today, I'm dedicating this podcast to all of the healthcare workers in the country who are in training, who are entering the field for the first time. And this goes all the way from physicians in high-level residency training programs to the nursing assistants, to the people who actually make our healthcare systems run. Uh, It's everybody in that group. We know we have suffered immeasurably throughout the pandemic in the healthcare worker field in terms of not only the issue of severe illness, hospitalizations, et cetera, resulting from your infections that you acquired while working. But in addition to that, it's also the stress that you've been put under. Many of you who may, again, have any number of job descriptions, what you do, nonetheless have had to sit in day-after-day environments 
of extreme pain and suffering and often wondering, can I keep this up? As a result of this, we now know that about one out of five healthcare workers among the 18 million healthcare workers in this country have quit their jobs during the pandemic, just literally because of the challenges it is to be a healthcare worker today, again, across the entire spectrum of job descriptions. Right now, as of uh, February 2020, we know, for example, that upwards of one half million people have just quit within the last year. And so, we're trying to replace these people. We need people to come in fresh. We need people to come in informed. We need people to come in educated. And we need people to come in with a compassion. And so this podcast is dedicated to you. Thank you for stepping up and stepping forward. We need you. We want you. And most of all, we hope that you find a satisfactory career in giving and in helping others struggle through this pandemic as well as all the other health challenges this podcast is dedicated to you. And let me conclude this opening of the podcast with uh, something that many of you have come to either love or just wish I'd skip over it quickly, and that's our sunlight. Today, July 8th, as Chris noted, uh, we will have 15 hours, 25 minutes, and 54 seconds of sunlight here in Minneapolis, St. Paul. Just two weeks ago, on June 21st, we actually had 15 hours, 36 minutes, and 50 seconds of sunlight here. We have lost about 10 minutes. We're on that downward trend, but we still have a lot of good summer and sunlight left to go. So take that encouragement to go enjoy the world. For those in the Southern Hemisphere, your time's coming. And uh, uh, we welcome the fact that uh, you have just been through the, some very dark days uh, and uh, we will be getting ready for those. But in the meantime, we're gonna celebrate what we have. Mike, let's start where we always do with the international situation. After months of global declines, the World Health Organization's weekly updates the last two weeks have shown cases climbing around the world once again. Is this the result of the BA4 and BA5 Omicron subvariants taking over? Well, the short answer is absolutely yes. The long answer is I still don't know where it's going or what it will look like two, three, or four weeks from now. I will make just one very specific comment that I don't need to repeat because if any of you have been routine listeners to this podcast, you know what I think about this is please do not be swayed. Do not be convinced. Do not have any real hope for anything that somebody puts in a statistical model more than 30 days out from today. And so you're going to hear lots of predictions about what will happen, why it'll happen, where it'll happen. And I can tell you with certainty that almost every one of these models will be completely wrong. And therefore, uh, you know, at this point, I will give you our best shot at what we think will happen here, but knowing that there's a lot of uncertainty and that anyone who gives you certainty right now probably also has a bridge to sell you. Chris, if anybody needed a reminder that COVID isn't going to just simply fade away, look no further than what's happening internationally in just the past month, even in the past two weeks. As of Wednesday, numbers posted on the WHO dashboard indicate that last week's case totals approached 5.3 million, up from 4.5 million the week prior. In fact, with last week's total, we've now seen weekly cases jump by more than 2 million compared to where we were just a month ago. And remember, this is happening at a time when many of us actually know cases are not being reported throughout the world. Uh, We know countries are rolling back their testing programs. They're using more at-home tests, which are not being reported in terms of results. And for that matter, we know in many cases, people aren't being tested at all, even in environments where it was obvious that this is what is happening. It's COVID. So for these reasons, I don't put a lot of stock in these case numbers. I can't even look at them from a trend standpoint, meaning that, well, it may not be all the cases reported, but is it uh, a representative sample? And at this point, we don't even know that. This being said now, for the sake of context, let me point out what 5.3 million cases means. With Omicron, where we've seen weekly cases surpass 20 or even 23 million on several occasions, a total of 5.3 million cases doesn't seem all that significant. Remember that concept of shifting baselines. You know, once things get so, so bad, if they get kind of not so bad, still bad, hey, that's better. And that's what many people right now are feeling. However, let me just put this 5.3 number into context. Between January 2020 and December 2021, I know it's hard to remember back that far, and most of us don't want to remember. 
but that was a span of about 100 weeks prior to Omicron's arrival. There were only three total weeks where cases exceeded the levels we're at now. So just again, let me put this into perspective. If you look at what happened between January 2020 and December 2021, when things were surely challenging, there were only three weeks where cases exceeded the levels we're at now. So from that perspective, and considering we're almost two and a half years into this pandemic, it's surely not a trend we want to see happening. Otherwise, as to what's driving the latest wave, I have no doubt it's tied to the rise of BA4 and in particular BA5. Remember, these are subvariants of Omicron. Both of them share multiple mutations on their spike protein, which improves their ability to evade the immune protection offered by vaccines or previous infection. And while they're often talked about in tandem, since they both have growth advantage over previous subvariants like BA2 or BA2.12.1, it's becoming evident that BA5 is winning the race. It is now the subvariant of real concern. According to the latest weekly EPI report that was published by the World Health Organization on Wednesday, 52% of the total sequences uploaded to an international database from June 19th to June 25th were BA5. That was up from 37% the week prior, so up from 37% to 52%. Otherwise, cases of BA4 have also increased, but not in the same degree, going from 11% to 12%. So it looks like one or more of the mutations that BA5 has in a non-spike region, which distinguishes it from BA4, are allowing it to outpace its Omicron relatives. As a result, we're seeing cases climb in places where BA5 has taken over. Based on the sequencing data, this includes countries in Europe like Belgium, Germany, Greece, France, Italy, the Netherlands, Switzerland, and the United Kingdom. In fact, according to the WHO dashboard, weekly cases in Europe as a whole have gone from less than a million in early June to almost 2.7 million as of this past week. Again, remember, this is in a time when testing and reporting are lagging substantially from what they were before. To give you additional perspective on what's happening in Europe, let me just cover a couple of the countries. For example, in the United Kingdom, where average daily cases have climbed from 5,000 a day in early June to over 20,000 a day now. The number of patients hospitalized with COVID has also risen from 5,000 to more than 10,000. Of course, during the UK's initial Omicron surge with BA1 and even their previous surge with BA2, hospitalizations reached 20,000. But at the same time, this is their third surge in what basically has been a half year's time. So COVID's impact on the healthcare system there remains significantly greater than we'd expect with other well-characterized respiratory pathogens like influenza. In addition, the UK has started seeing their average daily death toll from COVID climb once again, going from around 40 a day in mid-June to nearly 70 a day now. And as I noted, similar things are playing out in other countries like Austria, France, Germany, Ireland, Italy, the Netherlands, Switzerland, and a number of other European countries. They're all experiencing rising hospitalizations. In fact, in places like France, Germany, Italy, ICU admissions are climbing as well. Again, the overall number of admissions in these places remains below what they were during previous peaks. But with almost a thousand new ICU admissions each week in Germany, which is double the number they were at a month ago, and 600 in France, again, double the number reported at the same time last month. It's clear that COVID is still causing severe disease at levels that can bog down the healthcare systems and remains a serious and significant threat to the community. If we look at Israel, there were hospitalizations tripled in a month and a half, going from less than 400 in mid-May to now more than 1,400 in late June. And they are now just starting to decline. There are still at least 10 hospitals in Israel reporting more than 100% occupancy as of today, driven largely by COVID. So despite this notion that we're somehow done with COVID, we don't need to worry about these surges. You can see this combination of new variants and waning immunity leaves us in our healthcare systems plenty vulnerable. However, COVID is not just a problem in Europe. In fact, every region of the world is reporting case growth right now, including the Americas, the Eastern Mediterranean, Southeast Asia, and Western Pacific regions, even Africa, where overall cases appear to be dropping, which is largely an artifact of what's happening in South Africa. There are at least 16 countries that have reported rising cases over the past two weeks. One of the countries that we've often been uh, referenced to in terms of their performance versus ours is New Zealand. And if you look at what's happening in New Zealand right now, on Tuesday, 
In New Zealand, they reported 9,629 cases, more than 3,000 more than earlier in the week. Right now, there are 493 people hospitalized, where just one week ago, it was 110 individuals. If you look at their deaths right now, they are at 18 deaths per million population, the seventh highest in the world. Ironically, the country right now with the highest case fatality rate for COVID is Iceland, a country that we once used as a comparison to show how good you could be in responding to COVID. On Tuesday, China, which has seen more flare-ups across several provinces and cities in recent weeks, including Shanghai, announced that an outbreak in the city of Xi'an is being driven by BA5. In response, the city and its 13 million residents will be locking down until at least next week. I also want to add that numbers have been climbing precipitously by WHO reports for China, but know that that also now includes, uh, per WHO protocol, cases in Hong Kong and Taiwan. And so that when we look at the situation in China, that may be misleading uh, where we have only talked previously about mainland China. Let me just add one other piece that I think provides uh, some context right now, and that is the issue of seasonality. How many times have you heard people say, oh, we're going to have this surge in the fall or in the winter, whatever. You know, but suffice it to say, BA5's impact isn't exclusive to any one area or even hemisphere. And that shouldn't be at all surprising. Again, as a reminder, we saw South Africa's BA5 wave start in mid-April, peak in May, which is the country's fall season. Around the very same time, Portugal had their own BA5 wave, which took off in late April and peaked in late May. So two countries with two overlapping surges. However, while it was South Africa's fall season, it happened to be spring in Portugal. I still don't put much stock into the notion of seasonality with this virus. That being said, I continue to see stories out there hinting that winter months are and will be synonymous with increasing activity. And while that surely could be the case, I think we're still in a position where the arrival of new variants or subvariants will ultimately determine what happens. In fact, if you take a look at South Africa and what's happening there since the latest peak, you'll see that COVID activity is actually at its lowest levels reported since last November, despite the fact the country is now in the midst of its winter season. So just because it's winter doesn't mean cases automatically will grow. In fact, I would even go one step further and say because it's summer, cases won't grow. A number of COVID experts, talking heads out there, had continued to make claims that, aha, the Deep South suffered two very dramatic surges of cases in the last two summer seasons. And so therefore, they predicted this would happen again. As you know, I have often used the analogy that, remember, a broken clock is right twice a day and that we had no reason biologically to explain why these surges would occur in the South. And right now, there is no evidence of any surge activity in the South this year in contrast to what was said. Now, all of this being said, where do we stand in terms of severe disease and deaths? In the end, that's what this pandemic really has come down to. People are willing to accept COVID when it's a milder illness, but not severe illness and deaths. As I've mentioned in recent episodes, global deaths from COVID have been down relative to previous points in the pandemic. In fact, last week's total of around 9,500 deaths is the fifth consecutive week where the death toll has been below 10,000. Again, I don't want to minimize what this virus is doing or make it seem like the current toll is somehow a success or even acceptable. We can and should do much better. But when you consider where we've been the past couple of years, which included a stretch of 48 consecutive weeks where weekly deaths surpassed 50,000, we've certainly found ourselves in a much better position in terms of the mortality. Now, I'd like to think that the worst of the virus, at least in terms of mortality, is behind us. And barring the emergence of a new variant that is both more highly transmissible and more deadly, that could be the case. But what are we ultimately aiming for? Sure, we've seen previous surges that resulted in 70, 80, and even 100,000 deaths over the span of a week. In comparison, the 9,500 reported last week doesn't appear all that high. But should we really gauge where we're at now based on where we've been in the past? Remember those past peaks and also remember the issue of shifting baselines. In doing so, I think it can become easy for us to set the bar far too low. Instead, I think we'd be better off with a mindset that we found ourselves in a different position with this pandemic. We have vaccines, antivirals, and a better understanding of how to treat patients and improve outcomes. But what are we doing as far as expanding access to these resources? 
What's the plan for those suffering from the effects of long COVID? How long will vaccines really hold up? What happens if we start to see deaths go back up? In fact, right now, there are signs of global death starting to inch up again from the BA5 wave. And with rising hospitalizations and ICU admissions in a number of countries, including the US, the UK, Germany, and France, I think the death toll is going to increase over the weeks ahead. What impact will waning immunity or even new variants and subvariants have on severe disease and death in six months' time? What about a year or even five years ago? Again, I don't think enough of us are having these discussions or putting together these short, medium, and long-term goals. And without those, I think we'll continue to be in a position where we're two, three, or even four steps behind the virus. So with BA5 serving as our latest reminder that COVID's not done with this, I hope we can make some inroads in a new way of thinking about this pandemic. Here in the U.S., we continue to see between 105,000 and 115,000 daily new COVID-19 cases, a level that we've seen for more than a month, with modest but continuing increases in hospitalizations and deaths. And BA5 is now the dominant subvariant in the country, accounting for 53.6% of new cases. So, Mike, with what we know about BA5 and combined with waning immunity, could we be on the verge of another wave of infections and more concerningly, a more significant increase in hospitalizations and deaths? In other words, is there something about BA5 that concerns you more than the previous Omicron subvariants? Well, Chris, this is where that clarity becomes very, very foggy. Uh, As I've said numerous times on this podcast, I often feel like when I wake up in the morning, I have to chip five inches of hardened mud off my crystal ball in order to even get the day started. All I can say is, is that mud is getting thicker and it's getting tougher to get off the crystal ball. But let me give you some perspective of where I think we're at. I've already noted the fact that while our cases continue to hover here in the United States around 100,000 per day, I have no faith in that number. I will say right now, and I've said it consistently over the last three podcasts, and I can't wait until I can't say it anymore, and that is, I know more people in this past week who have been infected with COVID, people with three and four doses of vaccine under the belt, who are now actually quite ill. I think that is a function of BA5 as the subvariant that is now dominating, much more infectious, evading immune protection, uh, some waning immunity in humans, and all this new activity. You know, the public is done with COVID. The virus isn't done with them. How do we interpret what's happening in the U.S.? Well, I don't find that the kinds of data that we're reporting out, such as CDC's community transmission map, are necessarily that helpful. Right now, 86% of the U.S. counties are seeing high levels of community transmission, and that compared to 81% of the counties two weeks ago at the time of our last episode. I think this conclusion is valid. The problem is we don't really understand how much transmission is out there, even when we see high levels. What does high mean? Three, 10, 20, 500, 1,000? I don't know what it means. If we look at the wastewater data that is being collected by a number of state and local health departments, academic centers, and collaborating with the CDC, the challenge with understanding what's happening in our community is that much of these data points are from two, three, and four weeks ago. And... BA5 is taking over quickly. I can say here in our own state of Minnesota, where we have a very active wastewater surveillance program ongoing, numbers have risen quite remarkably just over the past 10 to 14 days. So, you know, data that's a month old may not at all be reliable. And we've been talking about BA4 and BA5 for weeks. And right now, as you noted, BA5 is now the dominant subvariant in the U.S. In our last episode on June 23rd, BA5 made up 11% of all cases, and BA4 made up 8%. And remember, for a case to be confirmed with a subvariant means they have to get infected, they then have to get tested, that virus then has to be brought to a laboratory that can do the actual evaluation to know what subvariant it is. Well, this all takes weeks. So when we report out data for subvariants among cases, is not tied to cases from this week. In many instances, it's cases three and four weeks ago. So while we say 54% of the new cases are BA5 and 17 are BA4, remember that these are often data reflecting several weeks ago and what happened. So this isn't a good way to continue to monitor what's happening. Rather, I'm looking at things like hospitalizations and deaths. 
for me, this is the most reliable way of understanding what BA5 is doing in our community. Hospitalizations are on the rise, now 13% higher than they were two weeks ago. Oftentimes, it's said that these are people who are hospitalized for something only to find COVID as a co-infection to that condition. That is surely possible when you have something widespread in a community. But what we're talking about here are cases that are attributed to a COVID-related illness. If you look at the rate of hospitalizations, there have been 2.6 new hospitalizations per 100,000 population per day. I know that's an abstract number. I'm going to come back to it, though, to give you a comparison based on what's happened before. So 2.6 new hospitalizations per 100,000 per day. There was an average of 35,000 people hospitalized for COVID on a given day, or about 10 per 100,000 population this past week. The current numbers are still much lower than during any surge. For context, the last time we saw new hospital admissions at this rate was right before and right after the winter Omicron surge in November of 2021 and in February of 2022. During the Omicron surge, new daily hospitalizations peaked at 8.5 per 100,000 which is the highest they've been at any point in the pandemic. So again, that abstract number I mentioned a moment ago, we're at 2.6 new hospitalizations during the very worst of the Omicron peak, we're at 8.5. If we look at the Delta surge, there were 5.3 daily new hospitalizations per 100,000, or almost twice as much as we see now. ICU numbers are also slightly increasing with 3,800 patients in ICUs daily for COVID. 11% of patients hospitalized with COVID are in an ICU, which has been consistent since early May. During the Omicron surge during the winter of 2021, 17% of hospitalized COVID patients were in the ICU. So again, this compares to the 11% that we're seeing now. Deaths have slightly increased. And as of Thursday, there was an average of 323 lives lost every day in the U.S. This is surely lower than that of the two to 3,000 lives we lost each day during Delta and Omicron. But this does not take away from the fact that 323 people are losing their life on average every day. This is not just a number, but these are people's loved ones, and we cannot forget about that. We are still not seeing any kind of sense of regionalization in hospitalizations or death trends. If we look at the top 10 states with the highest hospitalization rates right now, we see that one is in the Midwest, three in the Northeast, three in the South, and three in the West. Of the 10 states with the highest death rates, we see two in the Midwest, two in the Northeast, three in the South, and three in the West. The BioBot wastewater data I referenced earlier did show some regional differences. From the week of June 22nd to June 29th, which is the most recent reporting, and of course the challenge that I mentioned earlier in terms of timeliness, COVID-19 concentrations in wastewater increased slightly in both the Midwest and the Northeast, but slightly decreased in the South and the West. Remember, again, this is that whole prediction issue where uh, if we had listened to some of the talking heads, right now the Deep South should be overrun with COVID cases. Of note, the actual virus levels in the wastewater are hovering around the concentration was measured during the Delta peak. This is all to say that with transmission being high, it is certainly not a time to let our guard down. The coming weeks will be very telling. With the rise of BA5, which is better at evading immune protection than previous variants, And last weekend being a holiday weekend, we could be in for a flurry of cases. Nearly 2.5 million people went through airport security checkpoints last Friday, which makes the last weekend the largest travel weekend we have seen since the beginning of the pandemic. The pre-pandemic travel record was 2.46 million passengers in 2019. We could have the perfect storm here with the transmission levels high, large numbers of people traveling, shifting attitudes about the pandemic, and a new dominant strain that has been shown to increase hospitalization levels in several countries across the globe. We will need to keep our eye on things in the U.S. for the coming weeks. Remember, this pandemic is not done with us. I know no one wants to hear that, but it's such an important message. The New York Times this week noted many experts are concerned that the combination of reduced public testing, home test results not being reported in official data, And fewer states providing daily case updates means we have a much cloudier view of what the virus is doing and how the trajectory is changing. Mike, do you share those concerns? As an epidemiologist, the most important four-letter word that I know from a professional standpoint, data, data, data. That's how we make our living, trying to understand the reality of the current moment through data. 
So, yes, absolutely. I'm very concerned because I see an ever eroding basis of data for which we can make the kinds of uh, decisions we need to about what's happening. So I share these concerns. And at best, I know we have an incomplete picture of what is happening with this virus. We know that throughout the pandemic, the number of recorded COVID cases has been an undercount of the true number of cases. Not all people with COVID infection were tested, meaning that the number of cases reported has always been an underestimate. But as you mentioned, Chris, there are three other factors that make understanding what is happening with the virus a real challenge. First, it's reduction in public testing. Beginning in the spring of this year, many of the mass testing sites across the country closed or scaled back their level of operation, leaving public testing capacity at about half of what it was earlier this year. Second is an increase in the number of at-home rapid tests. While these tests are a game changer for identifying infection quickly and at a large scale, there is no systematic way that these cases are being reported and most go uncounted in official numbers. And of course, we also have to note that even with the at-home tests, we know there are many examples where there are false negative test results, meaning that it's clear that the individual has COVID. They're in a family setting where some have already tested positive by PCR. Uh, they all have the same illness, yet they test negative in lateral flow. So even if those cases were reported for lateral flow testing, these would never have been reported because they would still be considered as negative. And third, most states are only now giving official case updates weekly as compared to previously when states were reporting daily case counts. This means that the initial signals of upticks in case numbers may be delayed. We may have some days if a number of states all decide to report cases on Friday or on Wednesday or Monday where we can see big peaks in cases and then just for the next two days, really major valleys in case reporting. So it's much harder to understand what's going on in terms of that kind of situation. So if not testing, what other options do we have for monitoring community transmission levels? As we've talked before, one way is to do this through wastewater sampling or through the monitoring rates of hospitalizations deaths over time. But each of these metrics have limitations, including being a lagging metric of transmission impeding our ability to reduce transmission quickly. I would have to say right now that none of the official numbers we have are all giving us an adequate look at what's currently happening with virus transmission in our community. They may tell us what happened two or three weeks ago, but not now, and that's a challenge. So I look at this as how many people do I know with clinical illness that either is test positive or there's every reason to believe that they have COVID is probably the best indicator. And you know, I know that this feels like a meteorologist walking outside, wetting their finger, putting it up in the air to see which way the wind's coming from and saying, yeah, we got strong breezes from the Southwest. I feel like that's where we're at from an epidemiologic perspective. The kind of case numbers I'm seeing among friends, colleagues, and family surely support that we're seeing lots of transmission right now. I think that's really, really, really an important point. So while this is not completely flying blind, Imagine that the cockpit has no radar. The windows to the cockpit are completely fogged over, and we're trying to take off or land somewhere. That's kind of how I feel about where we're at with our numbers. Mike, last week, the FDA's advisory committee recommended that new COVID-19 booster shots contain an Omicron variant. And the FDA subsequently said that those updated shots should contain a BA4, BA5 spike protein component. That means the bivalent boosters developed by Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna, which were based on BA1, likely won't be ready now until mid-fall. Is that too late? And are we in a situation where the vaccines are always going to be a step behind this virus? Well, Chris, I think I'm beginning to sound a bit like a broken record. But anyone who has listened to this podcast over recent months will tell you that I have been saying time and time again, we cannot boost our way out of this pandemic, even with the use of Omicron-specific boosters. In addition to the concerns about boosters themselves, we've already discussed on this podcast the very low vaccine uptake in the U.S. and the lack of access to boosters in many parts of the world. I'm concerned that the use of a variant-specific booster is actually going to ultimately be an unsuccessful approach. Don't forget that right now we have throwing out over 90 million doses of vaccine in this country because of it expiring or unable to use because of how it was handled. There are tens of millions of discarded vaccine doses occurring every month now worldwide. 
So this is not a shortage of vaccine as such. It surely may be a challenge to get vaccine to the right location, but more often than not, this is about getting that needle in the arm, that last inch. So let's just be clear that there are several issues that are really operative with this discussion. Now, I want to be really also very clear that I don't think right now this country, or for that matter, anyone in the world, has a strategy for where we're going with these vaccines. Don't forget, when the first results of the vaccine trials were announced in 2020, there was a certain sense of euphoria. Haha, we have found the answer. Two doses of vaccine, and it seemed as if somehow you might be protected for life. Remember all of that when we told people that was all they needed to do? And the challenge is, is that unlike a measles vaccine model approach, where two doses may cover you for a lifetime and protection, this is much more like an influenza vaccine model, where you may be lucky if you get protection of any magnitude, uh, at least against infection, within months of the last vaccine you got. And so what we're in right now is a situation of where the vaccines we have are not doing the job we want them to do. They are surely still powerful. They are still reducing serious illness, hospitalizations, and deaths. But waning immunity and immune evasion are really important right now. So what we need are new game-changing vaccines, vaccines that can, in fact, provide durable immunity. Are they possible? I don't know. I hope so. I, as you know, as part of a SIDRAP team here, are leading an international uh, effort to define a roadmap process for coming up with these better coronavirus vaccines. But none of those are going to come anytime soon. It's going to take months to years before we might realize better vaccines. In the meantime, we have to figure out how we're going to use the vaccines we have. And I think in the very nature of your uh, question, you asked was how might this all work in terms of even timing? I'm certain that if we go into the mode of chasing variants to find the one that should be in the vaccine so that it can protect people, by the time that that could even happen, that variant will actually come and go. And we have to understand that it's not just a simple matter of protection with a variant vaccine. It's of note that right now we have many, many people who were infected with BA1, the very first emerging variant of Omicron back in January and February that are now cases again with BA5. So that really highlights the fact that just because you have a variant-specific vaccine, it doesn't mean that even within that variant, you may be protected with that vaccine. If natural infection doesn't do it, protecting you against BA5 by having had BA1 how can we be certain that vaccines themselves will do it? We have to be able to communicate much more effectively what these vaccines can do, how they can do it. Will they, in fact, reduce serious illness and hospitalizations, but not necessarily impact on the overall issue of clinical infection? We don't know. And I don't see this discussion going on in any meaningful way right now about what to do. I think the VRPEC meeting was all about one specific issue. Do we make this a bivalent vaccine with an Omicron-specific subvariant antigen included, or do we not? But there really wasn't any discussion at all about what is the future of these vaccines? How do we use them? And if we look, as I pointed out a moment ago, from those who did not get fully vaccinated by the CDC definition, a terrible definition, by the way, they've got to change that, fully vaccinated of two doses, versus someone who's had an additional booster dose or three doses, or somebody who's had two booster doses, a four-dose vaccine. We cannot continue just to assume that people are going to get these doses. Look at the loss of participation from dose one to dose two to dose three to dose four. You know, we're, we're not going to vaccinate very, very few people over time. So in short, I'm convinced that the announcement by the FDA about a BA4, BA5 component is going to be too little too late. And as they would say in my small Iowa farm town, a day late and a dollar short. That's what's going to happen. So what does that mean? Well, even more important than just BA4, BA5, what else is coming down the line? Are we going to have a BA8, BA12? Are we going to see pi as a new variant, sigma? If you talk to the viral geneticists and the people who I have a great deal of respect for, they'll tell you, surely we've got to expect that pi and sigma are going to show up. 
So how's the strategy in place to begin to assess that and what to deal with it? So we have imperfect tools right now. Do not mistake that for saying that they're not helpful. They can be helpful. They can reduce serious illness and hospitalizations, but they're not the final end product tool we need. But in the meantime, between now and then, how are we going to handle this? And I got to honestly say, I don't know. We'll continue our work at SIDRAP to do whatever we can to bring as quickly as we can the sense of a roadmap for new and better vaccines. But in the meantime, we got to figure out how to use these. I do not believe that a variant specific vaccine approach is going to really accomplish much at all in the days ahead. This brings us to our COVID query segment. Today's question comes from Philip, who writes, It seems like people who understand the risks of both COVID and long COVID will take reasonable precautions like wearing N95 masks, avoiding crowded indoor places, and limiting travel. But this definition of reasonable is highly subjective. So I'm wondering how Dr. Ostrom balances the risk calculations involved in his personal and professional life at this particular moment in the pandemic. And Mike, I think this is a question that a lot of our listeners have. How are you living in this moment? Well, thank you, Philip, for this very, very thoughtful question, uh, one that makes me incredibly uncomfortable. You know, talking about my own personal life to this group on one hand is obviously something I should do. I, I have to walk the talk and talk the walk. And I think that in this case, uh, it's a situation where I do not pretend to have all the answers. I'm at a place right now where I'm taking in lots of information and I'm kind of all almost an autopilot as to how I act or react. I feel like I'm, you know, looking at that center fielder in baseball, the all-star, who upon the pitch being thrown, watches it go to the plate, knows where the bat comes around and hits the ball, can tell by the sound of the ball leaving the bat where in fact uh, that may mean that the ball will go long distance, short distance, and then reacting without any regard to thinking about it, but knowing what are the winds like inside that stadium? How does the ball carry? Uh, you know, was the pitch a curveball that might have made the uh, hit one where the ball itself will take a curve as it comes out from home plate? All of those things happen automatically, and never once does the player sit there and think, now, I thought this one through. And to me, I'm almost in that same mode. I'm in a world where, number one, the one condition I know is that, that in fact, this virus is being transmitted at a very high rate in our communities right now. It is a virus that likely takes no more than a long elevator ride of exposure before one can get infected. It's a virus that clearly, as we've already discussed in this podcast, is causing less severe illness, less in the way of deaths for the total number of people infected, but it is still causing a substantial challenge to us. And long COVID is a reality. It is a reality. I look at the fact that I am, you know, almost 70 years old. I have had four doses of vaccine. Uh, I should feel good about the doses of vaccine, the age thing, and not such good news. But then I look at also a number of my friends and colleagues who they themselves have now recently become infected with BA5. And in many instances, they are also recipients of four doses of vaccine. They believe that they've been relatively careful. I hear from, unfortunately, far too many that said, well, I went to the restaurant just once and you know I took my mask off just that one time. And then three days later, they're sick. So the way I process this is to say, I do not want to get COVID. I am not a fatalist that believes I will. I surely could, but I'm going to do what I can not to get it. But I'm not going to change my life to be a cloistered individual with no contact. If this pandemic has taught me anything, it is the beauty, it is the grace, and it is the gift of relationships. So I'm at a place now where these relationships are so valuable to me that I'm not going to jeopardize my life. I'm not going to jeopardize that my health, but I am going to find creative ways in a sense to be in fact, able to have these interfaces and in relatively safely. It's in this regard that I will tell you that my partner and I, Fern, just came back 
from having spent a week driving out to the East Coast and driving back. And the trip culminated uh, in a wonderful evening at Tanglewood in the Berkshires at the James Taylor July 4th concert for which we had tickets for over two and a half years that uh, were not able to be used. Now, this was an outdoor concert in that uh, there were lots of people there, but it was outdoors. But the entire trip, my partner and I wore our N95s anytime we're in public places, anytime. And we did not eat in restaurants unless we could eat outdoors, spaced away from people. We are very careful even just getting gas, you know, using the restroom uh, in our hotel lobby, wearing our N95 respirator. You know, here I sit here today, you know, now almost four days later, and I'm still healthy. I test negative today. Uh, I think I've actually successfully completed this trip and have not caught COVID and yet enjoyed it immensely. If anything, I must tell you, there were moments throughout this concert where there were abundant tears out of just the excitement, the appreciation, the realization that I was there. And while Fern and I surely looked as if we were kind of the odd person out, one of the very, very few that had a respirator on, I felt so good to be there and yet safe. So I think what we're all looking for right now is how do we get together safely? You know, I wrestle with contact with my family. You know, I have two adult kids and five grandchildren. Unfortunately, because of schools, COVID has made their way through the kids and into the parents. So there are veterans of having had COVID, fortunately none seriously ill. They've all been fully vaccinated using the definition of how many doses they could have at this time. And so I feel more confident being around them. But at the same time, I also recognize that, you know, they are a risk to me. So one of the things that I spend a lot of time doing is attending outdoor baseball games at some distance with my grandkids. This is not the same as wrestling with them in the playroom, but it's, it's a great option to be there. So I think the message I would give is that what I'm trying to do is not surrender to this virus and not give up. I'm waiting for better vaccines. I know it could be some time before they come, but at the same time, I'm going to continue to try not to get COVID. I've watched too many of my friends and colleagues have rough courses. I know too many people have died. I also am very aware of people who are suffering long COVID. And I think that the kind of long COVID that we all worry about is one where it is truly a challenge that until you have long COVID, you can't appreciate and understand it. And I just want to share with you an email I just received uh, in the last day from a dear friend and colleague. And I get a lot like this. This email begins. So I have to say BA5 is no joke. I tested positive on June 20th. And for that week, experienced severe fatigue, a fever as high as 103, and a feeling like someone had shoved broken glass down my throat. So painful. But that's where it starts. Since testing negative, I've developed a horrible cough to the point where a few times a day I'm doubled over in pain, coughing. My internist has prescribed several prescriptions for me, and none of them are working well. I'm going to a pulmonologist later this afternoon for a thorough evaluation. I can only imagine what it would have been like had I not been vaccinated times four. I hope you are well. All the best. Now, when you hear about that, this is an otherwise healthy guy, an adult who has got four doses of vaccine. So this is not an illness that I want to get. I just don't. At the same time, I want to live my life. So I will continue to try to thread the needle. If you have respiratory protection, I think that's a really important friend to have with you right now, as well as the vaccines. And then modify behavior. You know, I'm not going to restaurants. I know the restaurant industry doesn't want me to say that. But, you know, how can anyone imagine that this virus knows to take a vacation when you have your respirator off so you can eat? I mean, they don't go on vacation. And with the transmission we're seeing right now, it is such that I am certain if you spend enough time in a restaurant, and I don't mean a lot, in the next week or two, you have a good chance of getting infected. The public's moved on. They are not going to change what they're doing to protect themselves or others. You have to protect yourself. So I'm living in the moment. I'm not giving up. I'm still seeing people. We have people come over to our condo uh, for dinners. 
we all agree that we limit any kind of outside contact for the days before the event. We all test before we come together and we do eat with a respirator off. And, you know, that's not 100% perfectly safe, but it's my way of saying this is the risk assessment I'm taking. And so I will do those things. We need each other. We need people. We need ourselves. So in this regard, don't give up either to the virus or don't give up that you still can't have a life even with the virus there. And I'm trying my best. If any of you have good suggestions for me, I welcome them. If you have criticism of what I'm doing, I even welcome that to better understand and learn how you think what I'm doing is not necessarily uh, in the best interest of either myself or my friends and colleagues. So, Philip, thank you for the question. I wish I could provide you more information. I can only tell you that right now I am traveling. I'm using my respirator. I'm fully vaccinated with four doses. And frankly, I'd have my fingers crossed. And now for the non-COVID portion of the podcast. The World Health Organization concluded recently that the monkeypox outbreak does not yet warrant the declaration of a public health emergency of international concern. But monkeypox cases continue to rise in Europe, the United States, and other non-endemic countries, and there is a shortage of vaccines. So, Mike, do you think that public health officials have a good handle on the situation? Well, thank you, Chris. This is a very complicated issue. Let me try to tease apart the various component parts of it in such a way that uh, you can understand how there may be both real challenges and problems, but also real solutions. Just to underscore the situation, as of this past Wednesday, there have been over 7,000 confirmed cases of monkeypox in 66 non-endemic countries, meaning the countries outside of Central Africa. 559 of these cases have been in the United States. These cases in the U.S. are still mostly but not exclusively occurring in men who have sex with men who have multiple partners. There are two major issues regarding monkeypox I want to cover in today's episode. The first is the current vaccination strategy in the United States. And the second is the ongoing transmission of monkeypox in Africa and the need to vaccinate the population there. But before we cover either of these issues, I want to give an overview of the two vaccines that are currently available for monkeypox, the Genios vaccine and ACAM 2000. Genios is a newer two-dose vaccine that protects against both smallpox and monkeypox. It has fewer side effects than the ACAM 2000, an older vaccine for orthopox viruses, including smallpox and monkeypox. Though most individuals who take ACAM 2000 have only mild side effects, some individuals, including people with HIV AIDS or other forms of immunocompromised conditions, can have very serious reactions. For this reason, most clinicians in the U.S. are choosing to use the Janios when vaccinating patients for monkeypox. The main issue with this is that we do not have an unlimited supply of this vaccine. While HHS is planning to provide a total of 1.6 million doses of Genios by the end of the year, this will clearly not be enough for everyone who is at risk to receive the recommended two dosages in a timely manner. Remember, we're in this situation in part because we have let the level of protection against the pox virus, in this case smallpox specifically, lapse when we stopped vaccinating the world against smallpox back in 1980. For the past 40 years in Central Africa, where most persons were protected both against smallpox and monkeypox because of the previous smallpox vaccination program, that entire cohort, 40 years worth of of individuals being born, growing up, living in Central Africa, now have no protection against any of the pox viruses. So in a sense, this by itself is a challenge of trying to deal with what's going on in Central Africa, and I'll come back to this in a moment. But this really brings me to the issue that I want to cover. What I consider to be here in the U.S. and for, unfortunately, a number of areas of the world, a disjointed approach at best for what to do. For example, here in the U.S., the current vaccination strategy is one where only laboratory workers that work with orthopox viruses and certain healthcare and public health workers identified by public health authorities actually should receive the pox vaccine, in this case, either ACAM 2000 or the Genios, before a potential exposure. Others can receive the vaccine if they are presumed contact. Previously, people could only receive a vaccine after having contact with a confirmed case, 
So this does broaden the population eligible to be vaccinated, but it's still unclear who exactly is included in this group. The CDC specifies that this may include people who have had multiple sex partners in the last 14 days, but does not state that everyone in this group should receive the vaccine. The guidance also does not say anything about men who have sex with men, despite the fact that most of the current transmission in the U.S. is occurring in this group. I feel like there's several real challenges here. Number one, we have a lot that we've learned from the days of HIV intervention and what that means for monkeypox. Back in 1983, 13,300 individuals died from HIV AIDS in this country. We knew a lot about the virus. We knew it was being transmitted sexually, particularly among men who have sex with men and have many anonymous partners. And despite this information, despite what we knew about safer sex practices that could be used, by 1995, realizing this is a chronic disease, 41,700 people died from HIV AIDS in the U.S. The number kept skyrocketing. The only thing that changed the course of this was the advent of the retroviral therapy that we have that today has been a godsend in basically keeping people alive for decades with HIV infection. And even more specifically now, keeping people from getting infected with pre-exposure prophylaxis or use of the drugs before one's ever exposed. So how do we deal with this? Well, I would strongly urge that we adopt a policy much like we have the HIV drugs. If you have multiple partners with unknown partners, you should qualify to get vaccinated. And at this point, to me, that's the same as we're seeing with the HIV drug prophylaxis picture. So this is an important point. We can't wait. Now, the challenge is there's not enough vaccine. We need to move as quickly as we can to produce as much of the Genios vaccine as we possibly can do. And we need to have a plan for how do we distribute that into the communities that are at greatest risk. Now, because by many who perceive this disease to be mild, it's not killing people yet, that in fact, eh, don't worry about it. On the other hand, there's also enough horror stories coming forward from individuals who have contracted monkeypox who have been seriously ill who are saying, no, you don't want to get this. This is now clearly a sexually transmitted disease, just as any ulcerative disease is that is sexually transmitted, whether it's syphilis, chancroid, I don't care, herpes. This is like that now. And we should get off the debate about is this a sexually transmitted disease or not. It is. Maybe there's also respiratory transmission. It could happen, but clearly it's sexually transmitted. So my whole approach right now is to say that, number one, is be straightforward and public about what the risk factors are. And you may say, well, you'll stigmatize gay men. Well, to not tell the truth as to what's happening is, in a sense, not giving them the information they need to act upon. You know, I was very involved in the early days of HIV AIDS with heterosexual transmission studies, and particularly among swinging groups. We had increased HIV transmission in swingers people who would get together for weekend orgies, for lack of a better term, at hotels. And we worked long and hard with them. We saw HIV transmission in those groups. And guess what? Nobody characterized them as being the traditional heterosexual sexual partners. So to me, it's the same situation. We just have to clarify who is at risk. And right now, it are these gay men with this large number of partners, many of anonymous. You can't do contact tracing with anonymous partners. And that's what we should be moving towards. As far as trying to blanket this, this is for the world. This is, in a sense, a new pandemic, but it's one that's very, very different than COVID. The respiratory transmission aspect of this disease is so limited that, in fact, it will be a slow, insidious spread, much like we saw with HIV AIDS, taking years to unfold. I don't see this going away anytime soon without a really proactive international vaccination effort, particularly those at highest risk. And for women who are having sex with bisexual men who may also have large numbers of partners, we're going to see spillover. And this is going to be a challenge. They too should be targeted for vaccines. So I do believe that this is a public health challenge, but I also believe it's one that's manageable. 
We just need to keep getting vaccine out. We need to be very clear who needs the vaccine. If you look at countries like Canada, the United Kingdom, they are starting to do that very effort of getting vaccines out to at-risk people and not waiting for a contact to follow up or the fact that somebody's known to have been in contact with an infected person. We need to expand testing. It's starting to happen, but testing needs to be expanded tremendously so that people are not challenged finding test sites or having doctors who can, uh, in fact, evaluate a patient and immediately submit a sample in for testing. We need to have that happen right away. Most of all, we will not stop this situation from continuing to occur if we don't shut down transmission in Central Africa. And for the sake of the residents of Central Africa, we owe them this. You will continue to see the spillover from rodent populations into humans in Central Africa until we are able to bring that population to a high level of protection. So we need WHO and the countries of Africa where this virus is endemic in the rodent population to also vaccinate their populations. And this is going to take a comprehensive effort over the course of months to years, but it's one that's really necessary. If we don't, these sparks of monkeypox virus will keep flying out of Central Africa and it'll just be deja vu all over again. Last but not least, we got to do this quickly and we've got to really understand how important it is anytime someone with monkeypox is in contact with certain animal species, such as having you know, pet rodents at home. It's really important they understand that they could transmit the virus back to them. And should that animal ever get out into the wild, we could see a major zoonotic slow size start in a given area. People say, well, that can't happen. Well, I can tell you right now, in 1899, when ships came over from China to San Francisco with uh, plague-infected fleas and rats on board the ships, that started the very first plague challenge in wildlife here in North America. And today, when you go look at particularly in the prairie states, uh, North Dakota, South Dakota, and the prairie dogs, and go through this, you see how much plague is there. That all came from an introduction just 120 years ago. And so we could have the same thing happen with, with monkeypox. We have got to understand that the rodent population is the primary reservoir for this, and we've got to make sure that it doesn't expand anywhere beyond that of Africa. Finally, let me just say that, you know, this will be a challenge and lifestyle issues will come to play here. And that is terribly, terribly unfortunate. As a public health practitioner, when I talk about who's at risk and why, it's all just about trying to stop the disease. And uh, I know that there will be people who will be critical of comments about we have to be very uh, blunt and we have to be very open about who's at risk and why. But if we don't, I think we do a disservice to those who are at risk for not trying to deal with this virus in an effective way. And right now, I don't see that happening in the United States, and that's a challenge. Mike, what can you tell us about this week's beautiful place submission? Well, first of all, Chris, let me say that, again, this is one of the most wonderful parts of this podcast is interacting with our our podcast family members, and the fact that, from my perspective, they help me so much get through this pandemic. I owe the listeners who participate in these uh, efforts uh, to find beautiful places, uh, to find beautiful moments. These are really, I think, uh, uh, just special gifts to all of us, and I thank them. I thank them from the bottom of my heart. I know that all of the podcast crew does, too, and, and while we can't use them all. We can't respond to all of them. Please know what gifts they are. This particular one uh, comes to us today from Christina. And it's it's a bit unusual. This is about some art as a beautiful place. But it's also a story that is all about what I think is the very best in the human soul. And Christina, you are that. She starts out by saying, thank you, Dr. Ostrom, for your informative podcast. I've been listening through much of the past two years. You've been spot on for good advice all along. She obviously doesn't talk to my kids. You give me strength to carry on during these difficult days. It seems like your topic for the week is usually what I've been thinking about all week, as if you were addressing my concerns all along. I just finished cancer treatments in February 2020 and was ready to start living life fully again, only to have COVID come along. So I had a hard time physically and mentally adjusting. 
I am an artist for over 40 years and struggled to do good artwork for much of the first year plus of COVID. I finally realized that through all the history, artists, poets, and writers have addressed the important issues of their day in their art to deal with it. So I found my special place with a big outpouring of a series of what I call COVID Guernica paintings. I have a couple of dozen oil on paper, a new medium for me, paintings that deal with COVID in some personal way. I have no end goal for when I finish them. I want to work on them as long as it takes. I had many shops and galleries that I had my artwork in before, but I pulled out of them all with COVID. So now I paint freely and I'm finally having a great time and thinking out current issues in a healthier way. Here were a few of the images. And there's a series of pictures that we will include on the website for you. But let me just tell you what she said about some of them. One, this is a neighbor's girl who spent almost half of her life in COVID. This painting reminds me of my Ukrainian grandmother who always wore scarves like this, but this has a contemporary twist. I call this one isolation for all the forgotten elderly and immune compromised locked in their small spaces for months on end. Another one, this is the first painting I started on and has a long way to go before it's done. Most of the paintings are quite large. Another one, I did this one early in the pandemic. I'll call it Tears to Come. Then there are two beautiful pictures of a very, very special young lady. And Christina says, these are smaller studies of my neighbor's girl again. She went on to say, I have many more, but here is one I think is done. I love the independence learned and the ability to entertain herself with joy. I'm not sure that's such a bad thing. These COVID children may be very thoughtful and resourceful adults someday. Thank you again for helping so many of us get through these times, Christina. The website will have the pictures as well as uh, you can read the her beautiful place again. I cannot begin to adequately express my appreciation to you, Christina. You know, I'm, I'm just a messenger. I'm not the message you are. And I hope you know that we so appreciate that. And I know as listeners on this podcast, they too appreciate what you've done here. It's beautiful. I wish you the very best. Thank you for what you've done. I, I know that this has been a tough time for all of us. And your artwork truly brings a beautiful place for this moment to the podcast. Thank you. Just a reminder to our listeners that if you want to share your beautiful place with us or a celebration of life for a loved one, friend, neighbor, or coworker who died during the pandemic, please email us at ostromupdate at umn.edu. Mike, what are your take-home messages for today? First of all, let me just say, I wish I knew where we were going with this pandemic. It's not done. Even though, as I've said many times, many in the public are done with the virus, the virus isn't done with us. And it leaves me at a loss for prediction. Uh, I've tried to be very thoughtful about making any kind of predictions. I've tried to make certain that if there were predictions made, what are the data that support them? What are the conditions that could cause it to be go this way or that way? And I can tell you right now, I'm as confused about what our future is as anybody could possibly be. So from that perspective, I will only tell you, I know that this virus is not done with us yet, but I know that BA5 is not likely to be as uh, severe a challenge for our population as was the original Omicron or the Delta variants. But at the same time, I don't know what's coming after it. There will be something soon after BA5. And what we don't understand yet is that good, bad, or indifferent. So the first point is, I don't know. As I've said to you far too often, the three most important words I think I own right now in my own world is, I don't know. Second of all is that we clearly need an international vaccine strategy, and we don't have it. These vaccines have been remarkable tools, but we're seeing all their weaknesses. We're seeing the inability for them to really bring an end to this pandemic. So please don't get me wrong. I still will get every dose of vaccine I can get that's coming down the pike. But I don't see that as a long-term solution. Rather, it's going to be the kind of work that we're doing right now to look at the landscape for game-changing coronavirus vaccines, that we're going to need to really do everything we can to make that a reality. But that's not going to come soon. That's going to be at best years off. So in the meantime, what do we do? How do we handle this? 
How does the world that is now discarding vaccine because it's outdating, not because they can't get it, how are we going to handle that? What are we going to do to change the vaccines going forward if, in fact, we need to because of a change in the virus? Again, we don't know. Finally, we're all searching for how to live with this virus. We all are. I gave some examples today. Some of you will probably look at me and say, ah, that's not right. That's wrong. Why well, you can't do this or do that. And you may be right. Um, I'm doing the best I can for myself and my family, my loved ones, to understand how to protect myself while still living my life. We all have to come to grips with that. But I do feel empowered. I don't want people to leave this podcast today saying, you can't. I went to the James Taylor 4th of July concert in Tanglewood, Massachusetts, and it was a hell of a time. I probably had tears throughout that concert more than anyone I've ever had. That's how much I appreciated that. You can do that yet. I'm still negative. You know, I'm now four days out. You know, I'm testing. And I think by, you know, being vaccinated and wisely using respiratory protection, I was able to do that. And yes, it was a compromised experience, but it was one of the best experiences of my life. And I can't say enough about that. So we all are learning to live with our lives in a world of COVID. And I hope that what I've shared with you today is helpful to you. And do you have any closing songs for us this week? I do have a closing song, and it's one that's very familiar to you. But let me take a step back and give you the backdrop. COVID has clearly challenged us with relationships. But in some instances, it's also opened up relationships. People taking new looks at friends, colleagues, people we didn't even know before, but now have a connection. And Fern and I have had had that very experience. We met a couple and their young son uh, in the earliest days of the pandemic through an email exchange that happened and it just built from there into Zooms. And we had the opportunity for the first time to actually physically meet them and be with them on this trip that we took out east. It was one of our stops on the way. And it was a gift. It was such a gift. The friendships that we have established with them will be friendships we'll keep forever. We'll celebrate and, and we'll love and cherish. And so for me, I also want to make it clear we can still do better during this pandemic. And one of the things we can do better at is making sure that we take care of those relationships we have in our life and not use the COVID experience as an excuse not to deal with others in the kind of way that we would want them to deal with us. And so I share this song to these dear, dear friends, lifetime friends now. And it's the song Friends by Elton John. And interestingly enough, it is the number one most used song in the podcast. This is the fifth time I've used it. I used it in episode 54 back in May of 2021, when uh, the title was Vaccines and Taking Care of Friends. Then I used it in episode 65 in August of 2021, The Ongoing Tug of War. I used it in episode 81, the early date in Omicron. This was in December of 2021. And then I've even used it this year in episode 97, entitled The Virus Isn't Done With Us. This was in March of this year. So today I'm gonna to use it one more time, and it is about friends. Is a song written by the English musician Elton John and songwriter Bernie Taupin, and is performed, as you know, by Elton John. It was his third U.S. hit and his second to reach the top 40 after a breakthrough success of your song. Uh, the song rose to number 34 on the U.S. Billboard's Hot 100 and number 17 on the Cashbox Top 100. Uh, this is a very special song and one that today means more to me than at any time it ever has. And so I share it with you. And I hope that all of you take this to heart and think about it yourself. So here it is, friends. I hope the day will be a lighter highway for friends are found on every road. Can you ever think of any better way for the lost and weary traveler to go? Making friends for the world to see, let the people know you got what you need. With a friend at hand, you will see the light. If your friends are there, then everything's all right. It seems to me a crime that we should age. These fragile times 
should never slip us by, a time you never can or shall erase. As friends together watch their childhood fly, making friends for the world to see, let the people know you got what you need. With a friend at hand, you will see the light. If your friends are there, then everything's all right. Making friends for the world to see, let the people know you got what you need. With a friend at hand, you will see the light. If your friends are there, then everything's all right. Elton John and Bernie Taupin. To all of my dear, dear friends, thank you for being there. For my new friends and for the friends that have become the gifts of my life, thank you. And at this time, when we are challenged by so many issues in our communities, not just COVID, but all the other challenges that we are obviously aware of, if there was ever a time to define who and what you are, it's with your friends. And I'm reaching out to my friends and I'm finding ways to, I believe, safely interact with them. That's what we all need to be doing right now. This is not about whether you can or can't have friends in a world of COVID, you can. And now's the time that we need those friends so badly. So thank you, dear, dear, dear friends. So as I close this episode, I just want to thank all of you again as listeners who have shared with us at SIDRAP your thoughts, your feelings, your concerns, your criticisms, your words of support. It means everything to us. We read them all. We read them all. And as a member of what I call that podcast family, I just want to thank you on the behalf of our team and me. And also just remind you, now is the time, if ever was a time to be kind. We need kindness so badly right now with everything happening in our world. We need kindness. I hope that you can find that kindness, and I hope you can share that kindness. As a scientist, I sometimes find it hard to understand abstract concepts that aren't somehow able to be shared in an equation or some kind of scientific description. And yet at the same time, it's those very kinds of abstract things that sometimes give me the very most wonderful feelings in my life. I've still never figured out what's that one thing that you can give away. And the more you give away, the more you have it's love. And that, that doesn't make sense. Does it? I give more and more away and I have more of it at the end. Well, I think right now we're all looking for that. We're looking for that. And so today, thank you for being with us. Be kind, be kind and be safe, but also enjoy and love life. Thank you very much. We look forward to seeing you uh, in two weeks. And in the meantime, be safe and be kind. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of the Ostrom Update. If you're enjoying the podcast, please subscribe, rate, and review. And be sure to keep up with the latest COVID-19 news by visiting our website, sidrap.umn.edu. This podcast is supported in part by you, our listeners. If you would like to donate, please go to sidrap.umn.edu forward slash donate. The Ostrom Update is produced by Corey Anderson, Meredith Arpey, Elise Holmes, Sydney Redepenning, and Angela Ulrich.